Hello? 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 Hi, hey, Susan, how are you? I'm, I'm good. Oh, there we go. Hi. Hi. Um, oh, excuse me. Okay. Hello? Um, he's not in. Welcome to the meeting. I see that uh, I don't know where I think uh, I now should be joining us soon. Um, if not, I have uh, an agenda, full agenda of things. We'll see who comes in. I, so, I need some advice. Okay. <laughs> um, it has to do with, um, well, it has to do with this paper that's due for the waves issue. Okay. Um, my paper got accepted, but they wanted more uh, information about the um, view or the adaptive field of the microscope, and then they wanted more organic image. So I did a Catoni Aster flower. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, trying to explain the depth of field. So it's the depth of field thing that's bothering me. Oh, why is that? Yeah, yeah. What, no. Do you want to share your screen or? Okay. Um, okay. Let's see if it works. I'm supposed to be getting fiber, fiber, fiber. <laughs> Some fiber in. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, I'm trying to share my screen. Yeah, it should be a button at the bottom, third over from the left. Yeah, well, I said share your screen and it, it won't. Hmm. Yeah, this grayed, it's grayed out, it won't share. Hmm. You need to log, in, log out and log back in or? No, I just it's maybe <laughs> I can't even turn off my. Oh, so what? What is the uh, like? What is the thing you were going to show me? Could you describe it a little bit? Or okay, I, what I did was I have this really thick paper, and uh, it's measured by a mechanical engineer to be 0.8 millimeters thick. Okay. And I put it underneath um, my ruler. I have a, a one millimeter ruler with markings of point zero one on it, which don't really show up, but the point zero five do. So I put the two together. I I focus it, and I get I can see the point five point zero five markings clearly. And then I took the paper out from under it so that I could show depth of field. And you can still see the 0 0.05 markings are a bit blurred. But I thought, of, okay, well, that works at 0 0.8 millimeters. So if you said the depth of field was 0.4 millimeters, does that cover the, the surface of the sphere with eight microscopes? Yes, it does. At least mathematically, it does. It does almost twice or three times, three, three times. The anyway, I have a sphere showing showing the the depth and as as an H and then the formula and the surface of the sphere formula and the calculations and and then this this thing that the. Uh, the depth. Okay. And I wonder if I need to include all of that or should I just describe it verbally and just skip the image. 
Yeah. Uh, probably cool. In the paper, because in the paper it would be definitely you'd want to show it. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. just yeah, to that work yeah. around figuring out depth. Yeah, I think the yeah the the micro well the microscope you have is unique enough that like people would want to see it as much as they can about it because it's not a typical microscope so they want to know if it's yeah. how much oh, it's right. yeah how much it's the same or different than all right I'm putting it in PowerPoint converting it to PDF and then copying and pasting it into my my um, article. <laughs> Well, that's There's good. Doesn't like copy paste these days. I'm not sure what's wrong with it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, and uh, you said you did a flower as well, like a. Yeah, I have a Catonia aster flower. Okay. That's good. And it's uh, 0.5 um, millimeters by no 0.5 centimeters right. by one centimeter. So it shows the range of the microscope a bit better, like. It can do quite small objects, and then it can do larger ones. And uh, I will get out the shell stick. <laughs> 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 I took pictures with one microscope. They're quite intriguing patterns on the shells. Okay. Do you have the shells under the ball oh, microscope? I, or? I hear you did. <laughs> Uh, those those shells are so small; they're almost as small as an axolotl embryo. Yeah, well, they're quite, especially one of them. Yeah. All right. Anyways, yes, I I I almost asked you if I could include them in the the uh, in my my paper instead of the Catonia aster flower, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just put the flower in. They said they wanted something more organic. Other than a peppercorn, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not well. So I a flower. Here's a flower. <laughs> and yes, it's a reproductive part. So don't tell me it's not an embryo part. <laughs> I don't know what they're going to think. So yeah, they're they're shy about sex lives of plants. Uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Anyway, I have that. I think that's okay that I, I include the extra diagram explaining. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. So, good. Uh, now, my knock, uh, how are you? There he is. Yeah. Yes. And I'm hoping that. Uh, yeah, you're cutting in and out. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm doing great, Bradley. Okay. And I'm sure you are doing well too. Okay. <laughs> so, do you have an update for us, or? Yes, of course. I was okay. waiting for this. So, should I go? Should I go ahead and? Go for the update. Yeah, yeah, share your screen. You can. Okay. Here, I'll just turn my visual off. Oh, sure. My house is a mess today, anyway. So. <laughs> okay, so, so is the screen visible? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'll start with my update for last week. So, last week's goal was to actually upgrade the devour and cell membrane segmentation model <laughs> and like and to start up i basically uh, like i basically tried to see what's like if if uh, like if there was something wrong with the data which was being used for the training so like the first issue that i faced is that there was a slight offset in the in the file names of the images so i'm not sure if that trailed along to the training but like but still, I just fixed it out and it works well now. And then, like, the code which was present to pre-process the MATLAB files, the raw data, the code which was present for doing that, it was actually storing it as the JPEG format. But then, like, I, uh, like, last week I actually had learned my lesson and I, I actually changed the format to PNG. 
and like just to give you an example like if the images are stored in the jpeg format after you, after you pass it for training it looks somewhat like this the segmentation maps look somewhat like this i think i have given an example regarding this last week right it was something close to this but it was on different data but the segmentation maps as you can see like the edges are not very clear and there's a lot of new noise in the edges so i of course i decided to go for the other format and to actually to tackle that noise uh, some code was being used some open cv based code was being used to uh, to be separated of that noise so what was happening is that the the edges of the segmentation maps were getting cut out like as you can see in this segmentation maps like the samples to the left are from the old training data so in this segmentation maps you can see that the edges are a lot uh like i don't know how to put it but it's a lot thicker the the borders are a lot thicker like like uh, the open cv algorithm that was being used to uh, to basically remove the noise from the borders it's actually training into the segmentation map itself which is not good news but the new but the new training data is actually the other case the segmentation maps are completely preserved and like there is no training noise and there is no uh, open cv business to get rid of the noise so the segmentation maps are like they are nearly perfect except for the resizing that's that's uh, that's we really, like i guess the resizing is absolutely important so that's that actually has to be done but except for that there is no loss of data so that was the first step on improving the on improving the model and then the second step was to and the second step was to like add in a couple of more augmentation techniques so i'll just open up the notebook so okay i'll go back to okay so as you have seen like the segmentation maps usually look like this like they have a black background and they have a foreground but there is only one cell towards the center there is only one embryo towards the center right yes so with like i've used some augmentation techniques which basically have it has basically introduced Like, okay. it has basically introduced some like what it did. I'll call it okay. Okay. I hope you can see the samples here, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the new augmentation techniques, what it does is that like it takes a like it's actually the formal names are uh, the formal names are a grid distortion, uh, optical distortion, and shift scale rotate. These are the three new ones that I've used, and what it does as you can see like there is not only one embryo to the center but there are also like fragments of embryos towards the uh, towards the borders or towards the random parts of the of the image and like i'm pretty sure it's actually helping with uh, helping with the model and it's, it's actually helping with the robustness of the overall model and the, and the performance so that was another thing that i did and so Okay, so next is the optimal part. Next is the automated hyperparameter optimization. So I'll okay. So I used a library called Optuna to actually automate the process of uh, finding the optimal hyperparameters. So like I actually use it to optimize the learning rate and the batch size to optim to to basically have the maximum intersection of a union score. so to give you as an example this is okay so so this is the code for that but i will not look into it right now i'll just tell you what it does so what it does is that it trains the neural network on only a 10% of the available data and it trains it within like it trains it with some uh, parameters within a given range that i have set and it actually samples from that range and it tries to see which like with which set of parameters that it it actually performs the best so according to that it basically optimizes the it it actually optimizes in that range and it actually tries to find the best learning rate and the best the batch size so i have actually run it only for five trials now like the model is trained on the 10% of data for only five epochs but i can do it for 1000 times or 100 times and actually that's what i did i actually ran these trials for about a 100 trials and then i came up with some came up with some values for the learning rate and the batch size and like as you can see like it goes 
for trial zero, I'll, I'll finish this with some score. This score actually represents the intersection over the union score. And it does the next trial and it does the next trial with a separate set of learning rate and a batch size. And actually stores the best trial along the way. Like as you can see, in these five trials, it says in the end that the best trial is trial three with an intersection over the union's value of 0 0.50, which is 50%. So, like I did this for a hundred times, I just ran this loop for a hundred times, and I just sat back, saw it happen, and then I got some, got, then I got some parameters which could be seen using this bit of code. Study the best trial, and here we can have. Okay, so here we get the best, here we get the best parameters, which is, uh, like it gives you the running rate and the batch size which was suited best in the in the given range, and okay. And then I use those, and, I, and then I use those parameters to train a new model. And these are big metrics; it's not very interesting, but here they are. If somebody names it, and then I compare the old with the new model. Okay. Okay. So if we compare the new model and the and the old model, have to be on the same data. These are the results that we are getting. So is the GIF visible? Is it? Yeah, yeah, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so, like, it's pretty obvious from here that the edges are sharper and it's a lot tighter, as Bradley said. And I think, like, for tracking smaller cells, this is a useful thing. And in some other samples that I found where, like, the input images are there, like, if I put the same input images to both the new and the old model, the old model has these uh, segmentation maps, which are a lot more rough and the edges are a lot thicker. But in case of the upgraded model, like the edges are a lot better. But something interesting that I've noticed is that, I have to zoom into the image for this. Okay, so in this specific case, as you can see, like the, the original mask, it actually contains a little um, mistake over here. Like, in between these two cells, there is clearly a boundary, right? but in the original mask, that in the in this in this mask, there is no boundary here. It's, it's actually a partial line here. That's all. But the model, it 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 actually captures the boundary, even though the original mask was something else, because it has on this it has the awareness of the rest of the data which is correct. So using that awareness, it actually it, it actually can transfer that to the, to the wrong parts and it and it can yield the right results. And the same thing could be observed here too. Like here, the segmentation maps are merged between two cells, which is not. But the model has learned from these other parts where the segmentation maps are correct. It has learned that this part is it should not be like this and it should be like this. So that's something interesting that that's something interesting that I saw. And the next photo is this. Like this photo is very dim. Like as you can see, this photo is very dim, and the original mask looked something like this. And the and the old model completely failed on that. But the new model sort of caught what was going on, and it's it's sort of close to the original mask. Hmm. So so these are the different. Uh, and, and this is the direct comparison, but I really did not get time to uh, deploy this into a GUI and check it out. But I don't think it will take much time to replace the model. And in fact, I'll be replacing the model in the library itself very soon by today itself. Yeah. So I think that's it for this week's update. And if anyone has any comments, can go ahead. Thank you. Good. Good. Thank you for that, Mainak. Uh, yeah. 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 I thought that was good. That last image you showed, where you had that image where it was very weak, uh, the the fluorescence. Yeah. And then I was able to recover most of that image. I mean, you know, you had like yeah. some boundaries that weren't defined, but it basically the old model just didn't get it at all, and so. Yeah. 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 yeah actually, these are the sum of the examples and. Like you can also generate a lot more examples using the code that I provided in the GitHub repository. So if somebody is so if somebody wants, so they can just go to the GSOC printing and repo and all the collab notebooks are available there and it runs on collab freely. So you really don't need a, a lot of compute power to run on this. Okay. 
Yeah. So that's the that's the best one. And there um, should be. Oh, go ahead. Uh, can I make a suggestion? If yeah. you look at the lower right hand corner picture that you just had on the screen. Uh, okay. Is it this one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The right hand. The right hand one. Yeah. Okay. You see three lines that don't. Uh, yeah. That end. They're, okay. Three. Three. Of these ones, right? Yes. Now. Yeah. Is there any reason not to detect such lines and just extend them as straight lines? So can I? Okay. So like, as you can see, like if if we if we just look at this part where the lines they don't end, right? And if you look at the input image, if you look at the input image to the right, the same happens here too. Like there is no line here. Like the line comes up to here, and then yeah, basically I, I really cannot see anything. Yeah, I understand. And, and I guess that's the reason why I could not map it to the. Yeah, yeah but it, but it, but if you did that deliberately, uh, it it would be analogous to uh, a phenomenon in human vision called filling in. Yeah. Okay. And then you could fill in the lines, and then you would have proper segmentation, even though it's not in the data. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that could be done. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you could use some. I got it. Don't clean the lines, right? Okay. <coughs> Basically, it's very simple because you just have to extend them. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> like an interpolation algorithm. Of, well, I guess you could be. That's one way to go. But well, yes, sure. if you can detect an incomplete line. Yeah. Yeah. Then, uh, then you only have to do is extend it until it hits another line. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah, because we are pretty sure that the, like this line actually should go completely here. So yes. maybe we could use some algorithm in, in post processing to detect these lines and just fill up these lines. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, we had a picture of uh, Drosophila uh, imaginal disk, which uh, took about ten hours of filling in lines by hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, you know, it, it, it's probably a worthwhile uh, addition to the program. Yeah, actually, like, like, in, like, maybe we could try with some algorithms here. Like, I don't think by hand is the way to go here with all these computers and all this new stuff coming up. So I guess there has to be some way to. Automate the process. So I look at that. Thanks. Well, yeah. Basically, you have to detect an, in, an, yeah. a line that ends in the middle of another cell. Yeah. And another thing that I forgot to mention is that like the data is actually acquired from a paper. So I have linked to the. So I have actually added a link to the paper in the in the blog post. So like it's actually the same paper that Moyuk had used last year to acquire this data. So it's actually the same data, but the pre-processing is actually way different. So that's the that's the so that's the different. And I've linked everything in the in the blog post, so anybody could check it out. Let's go ahead and put that in the chat. Okay. So is my screen still sharing or is it? Oh, it's off now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. if you guys want me to go and like just. Just go back to something else. Just let me know. Then I'll share my screen again. All right. Okay. Uh, Susan, did you have a comment? Well, just that it was that's very nice programming, and I put that in the chat. Um, yeah. I maybe would like to use this, depending on what I'm doing. Um, I'm after all compressing a tissue, so it's going to have distorted. Um, Boundaries between the cells, and maybe I'd like to see that um, reduced to lines, and instead of um, I don't know, instead of the whole thing, if you could just see where where the boundaries are, it would be useful. Yeah, sure. So maybe you can send the data, or maybe you can just show us the data, and then maybe we can look into it after this. Okay. Well, I haven't managed to do that yet. My compressor is 
at the university and it was built a year or so ago <laughs> and I haven't been able to go back to get it. So it's one of those things. Yeah. 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 That's great. Uh, yeah, I was looking at the chat. I saw a couple things, and they were very good, very nice programming. And then Minot put his uh, blog post in the, or well, linked his blog post in the in the chat. So I had a question about the method. So what what is the? I mean, what's the difference in terms of the algorithm between last year and this year, or the the current model and then the one you're implementing? Okay, so if you look at the neural network itself, like. Okay? So if you look at the architecture itself, the architecture is actually the same because I tried out a larger architecture which is uh, VGG19 and like, I tried to put ResNet152. So these architectures, this, they are a lot larger and they consume a lot more space. So the trade-off is actually pretty huge. Like if you look at the size of their models, it's actually thrice the size of the existing model. So what I did is that I used the same architecture but I trained it on a differently pre-processed data and a different set of augmentations and a different set of hyperparameters, which was found using auto, which is fine, which is found using an automatic technique. So I guess that's the difference if you wanted to know. That's the difference. Okay. The neural network architecture is the same. That's all. Alright, yeah, I was wondering what if you had changed the architecture at all or yeah. if you were just using differences in uh, yeah. yeah. No, actually, Manu had told me like he wanted to make sure the model remains uh, sufficiently small to run on people's to run on people's computers, and to make that, I actually had to go with a smaller model, which is the existing one, the ResNet 50 architecture. And like, if somebody wants to know that what sort of what the exact name of the architecture is, it's actually called an FPM. So. I'll just link to the paper soon. It's actually a segmentation network architecture and it's like it's a, like it, usually people use UNET but we decided to use FPM. So there are a lot of reasons to do that. I was reading into that a week a week before, like I sort of understood what's going on, why we used FPM. So that's the reason I actually went for the FPM with the SD50 backbone. So. All right. That's good. Thank you for that update. Yeah, uh, and speaking of the and speaking of the GUI, yeah, and speaking of the GUI, I think I had shown it last week. I probably did. Yeah, I think the so. prototype GUI that I. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you did. Oh, so yeah. You, yeah, so, that's, okay. yeah. So for that, we could use the existing model as a drop-in replacement for that. Like it, we can just we can just change the names there, and it, it would work. So that's also another reason why I use the same the same architecture, and that's all it is. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Okay, thank you for that update. Uh, so yeah, that's good for. Uh, so let's move on. I wanted to mention that uh, Steve McGrew, who was an original member of the group when we started in 2014, uh, unfortunately he uh, lost his battle with cancer this last week or so, and uh, it's a sad time. But we have a little bit of. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to go back over some of the things that he's done. He was a very uh, interesting person. He was a polymath. Uh, what they call a polymath, which means he was in, involved in a lot of different things. So you're like, why? what was his specialty for this group? Well, he was interested in um, I think biological complexity. He was also interested in computer uh, science. He had a number of different uh, algorithms that he had uh, worked on, especially in uh, genetic programming. And he also did some microscopy. And so I'm going to show some things here if you want to catch up on them. Uh, after the meeting or, you know, it'll give you some sort of background into his work. So let me share my screen here. So, uh, okay, I think this is, so this is Steve's company, uh, New Light Industries Limited. So he founded this company 
Uh, it was founded in 1992 in Spokane, Washington, and that's in the U.S. Uh, he founded this, they did a lot of things with engineering and with uh, sort of merging computer science and engineering, uh, doing a lot of holography. So this is where you create holograms, uh, doing some UV imaging, uh, electroforming, vacuum coating, optics, robotics. So there is a very wide range of things that they were doing in this company. And so this was uh, a range of things. He had a number of patents as well. So his patents, uh, here's a list of his patents. He had uh, all sorts of different patents in like physics and engineering and uh, quantum dot security device and method, for example, or a method of apparatus for reading and verifying holograms. Um, Here's one uh, more holography down here. So he was very much at that interface of like uh, imaging and technology and programming. He did a lot of stuff with genetic algorithms. I'm not sure if that's reflected in his patents, but I think you can see that he was doing a lot of different things uh, and he was getting patents on them. So, um, so that's one way that he made a contribution to the world. It was very uh, interesting work. There's an article here. So he's from Spokane, Washington. He was his business is based there, and this is uh, from the local paper. Uh, an article from 1997 on his work. So this was quite a while ago, but this is. So he did a lot of. Uh, he was also an artist, and he did a lot of things with uh, metalworking, and so his holography fits into the metalworking aspect of it as well. It's sort of like the. Uh, you know, that, that sort of general arts, uh, you know, craftsman type thing. So Steve McGrew, his three-dimensional work shows up on credit cards licenses. And so uh, counterfeiting is a good business for new light industries. They weren't counterfeiting money. They were trying to build hol holographic security technologies for money, paper money. So if you look at, uh, I don't know how, how it is in other countries, but in the United States, and I think in Canada as well, the money has special security devices built in. They have holographic verification. They have different things that they put in, they print on the money that help people detect real uh, bills from forged bills. And so uh, he was, his, some of his work went into that sort of thing. It was very practical. Um, and he's been, been doing this sort of stuff with holography for decades. And so this really has its roots in physics. So, you know, it's not just like engineering, it's also a lot of physics that you have to be, uh, you have to be conversant in. And so uh, New Light Industries makes equipment that produces holograms. Besides refining the technology, McGrew said he also is trying to make holograms affordable for small customers. Want a relatively small number of copies on, for example, a letterhead. And so this article just kind of goes over some of the just basically profiles the business. Um, so he was 51 in 1997. So that puts his birth date back in the 40s. So he was in his 70s when he died, correct? I think Dick would know for sure. But so, you know, he, he spent a lot of his life uh, work. He was a chief engineer. Um, he did a lot of things. Uh, so he lived a uh, you know, a fairly long life. He actually, this was an interesting part of this article. They talked about, he started out in California. He founded this company called Light Impressions and the company was doing $5 million a year uh, business. Uh, they were located in Santa Cruz, California. And this was in the eighties. And then in 1989, there was an earthquake in the San Francisco Bay area. And uh, the problem was, is that his Home, the earthquake split his house in two because it was right near the epicenter of the earthquake. So then he ended up uh, leaving California, moving back to Washington State, and that's where he found New Light Industries. And uh, that's where he was for most of the rest of his life, I, I, I assume. But uh, this was, you know, so he had some visions for this beyond just the practical, though. Uh, McGrew said he had also tinkered with virtual reality eyeglasses. My vision for that is a wearable computer. 
but that's a lot of time to develop the idea. So we haven't talked too much about uh, virtual reality in this group, but there, there's a really uh, good, uh, there's a really strong connection between holography and virtual reality, especially creating visual illusions for people to interact with. So uh, that's something that uh, he didn't get to see through, um, but there is this, he did do a lot of stuff with algorithms and, and genetic algorithms. And uh, he was doing some stock market prediction as well. So he's, he went into a lot of different areas. Um, Definitely think that's so. I I can make a list of things for people. I can send them out via email if people are interested in checking them out. Although I covered a lot of that in the in this little uh, presentation. So, um, did anyone have anything to add on that? Uh, yes, he was very interested in morphogenesis. He kept sending me papers I didn't know about. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's how, well, I mean, that's why he was interested in this group. I mean, yeah. So that's great. I mean, you know, it's, uh, well, what was that? One, one thing, uh, yeah, one thing he, he wrote a, he wrote a book, uh, which, uh, he was going to make it into a Kindle book. And, uh, my wife, Natalie, and I, uh, help prepare it for that but uh, he never followed through on it he didn't he didn't think the book was good enough mm -hmm. uh it's it was a it's a book on consciousness okay wow <laughs> okay no um, no tony deluca would be very interested in that it yeah consciousness, Dick. it was evolution oh, it was on evolution excuse me oh, okay. <laughs> Not consciousness uh, okay. it's, been, it's been many years since I read it. Uh, at any rate, uh, we we might look into the possibility of publishing it posthumously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it, it requires some work because he, he, uh, he has figures in it which require getting permissions to use. Okay, yeah, it's usually a problem. Okay, so, well, it's not that big a problem, but it's, uh, it, it, you don't want to publish something and then to have a publisher come after you and say, you used my stuff, baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you redo the images? Can, can you redo the images, or? I don't know. It's, as it said, it's been years since I looked at it. Oh, okay. Probably five years or so. My yeah, book, I thought it was a good book. <laughs> okay. My, my sister's a whiz with images. Oh, okay. Well, uh, maybe uh, I'll... Okay. I'll, look, do me a favor. Send me an email to remind me. Uh, and I'll, I'll send a copy of the book back to you and you see what you can do with it. <laughs> okay. Um, are none of the images his or... I don't think so. I think that was the problem, but uh, I, how crucial they are to the text is not was not obvious. I think so. You know, or they might be might be easy to get substitutes that are where we can get permission, okay. uh, or we might be able to get permission from the ones you used. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's the only obstacle, uh, but I think it needs some reading to see if. If his opinion was wrong, that the book is not good enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's always the thing, you know, it's getting people to... Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we have to override his opinion if we want to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, anyways, yeah, that would be a nice... Uh, so, yeah, that would anyways, be nice I... Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's Okay, good. so we'll... we'll, we'll... Okay. Anyone interested? Send me send me a note. No, send you a copy and see what you think. See what you can think. What you think about it? Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. But uh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. What do we have in the chat here? We have a couple of things. I wanted to make sure we covered those. Uh, Dick had a note to my knock. I could dig out the before after hand correction of the Drosophila I imaginal disc 
where we filled in incomplete lines by hand. And then Minoc would like to check out the data. Yeah, so we have those. We also have that uh, biosystems paper on sort of analyzing. Yeah, this would be a challenge. The, the number of cells in that image, uh, oh, gee, probably a couple of thousand. Yeah, yeah, it was, I think, 10,000 <laughs> at least. Uh, 10,000 or so? Yeah. Oh, you remember the image, okay. Yeah. So we yeah. Had, yeah. yeah. My so, late mother did the filling in. Right, right, uh, right. It took a long time. <laughs> so yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty high resolution image. Like it was hand drawn, but it was a very high resolution image of the structure. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, but it was but it was incomplete. We had to complete it in order to get cell counts and cell sizes and stuff. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. Maybe we'll pull that oh. stuff up. Uh, maybe for next week too to talk more about it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So my screen's already being shared. So I also wanted to point this out. And this is, uh, if you're interested in learning more about OpenWorm and about sort of the thinking behind OpenWorm, there's this Carbon Copies Foundation workshop. Um, they're doing the Carbon Copies Foundation. I, I think they're doing some sort of whole brain emulation of uh, like they're, they're, I think their interest is uh, ultimately consciousness, but their interest is in this whole brain emulation idea where you can emulate whole brains to see if you can build, you know, intelligence. It's sort of like an artificial general intelligence approach. Uh, why I bring this up is that Stephen Larson, who was uh, one of the co-founders of OpenWorm, he actually talked at this workshop. He was the first speaker. So uh, this was yesterday, but it's on YouTube. There's a YouTube link in, the, in this information here. And uh, this live stream, if you go to the live stream, you don't have to sign up. Uh, they talked about, um, they, they had a talk with Steve Larson. I think it was about 30 to 45 minutes long. And he talked a lot about his motivations for starting Open Worm, his educational background, why he got interested in what he did. Uh, essentially it was, he was uh, Steve Larson was originally interested in this sort of AGI, this artificial general intelligence. And he moved on to sort of figuring out what he needed to do to, to make that happen. And he, you know, he was thinking in terms of like organisms as you might expect people to be thinking about. And he figured that you needed to have an anatomical model of the organism. So he went from sort of an AGI lab to uh, a lab where they did a lot of neuroinformatics. Uh, and then he moved on to OpenWorm, which was to take, you know, to find a practical model organism and to build the anatomy to build what was going on there and then produce with that something that produced simple behaviors and then work from there and see, you know, if we can understand that and we can simulate that, then we get closer to this sort of artificial intelligence. So. Uh, it, it's worth watching the whole talk. Um, you know, he's talking to these people kind of informally, but at the same time, there's this, you know, you get a lot of good ideas of what's going on there and you're, um, you know, able to see kind of the path that he took and maybe how that's really uh, important. And, and, you know, it gives you some background as to sort of what Open Worm is doing and why they're doing it. So um, I would check that out if you have time. So that was the workshop there. Uh, then I want to go to the submissions documents. So we have, uh, we don't have very much, out, well, we have some things outstanding, nothing with a hard deadline necessarily. Um, the paper on, um, uh, the paper on the bacillary and non-renal cognition is a somewhat hard deadline. Uh, I'm trying to pull that together into a, a more formal draft in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but some of the thing, I guess that's number seven. Uh, but some of the things I can put red on that. When I use red, it means that I want to like get it to completion fairly soon. Um, but other than that, we have you know things like the DevLearn paper, which is this preprint, which will probably wait till the end of summer here, uh, once we can incorporate my Knox work into it. Um, then we have the Boring Billion in the Kindle book. So the Boring Billion is this 
stuff uh, about you know embryogenesis from way back yeah you know, early early days of embryogenesis and even before that um the kindle book was i think an idea that uh krishna had about getting all the Diva Worm ML materials together. So that's also outstanding. We'll have to update that. I'll update the materials before we can talk seriously about a book. But uh, then we have the Mathematics of Diva Worm, which is, again, not really moved since the last time we talked about it. We have this Test of Williamson Symbiosis, which was this idea of... where It's, it's a heavy uh, sort of genomics, uh, bioinformatics work where you're comparing genomes to see if there are thing you know, in organisms that there some organisms have what we might call multiple developmental programs. And we want to see if they have genes that enable these two programs to coexist in the same organism. So it's it's this idea of, of testing some of these ideas but but looking at the genome to see if we can validate it in some way. Um, this requires, of course, that you have some background in uh, genomic analysis. Uh, so that's not for everyone. Uh, the same thing with the molecular level simulations. You know, we're looking at higher order movements in diatoms, um, and especially like the sort of the, you know, changes in acceleration, many uh, derivatives of that. So we're looking at jerkiness specifically. And this is going to be, this is for a special uh, project called RAFE. And then uh, we have the smoother jerky diatom movement. So this is with, a, with Thomas Harbick, but this is sort of related to 24. In 28, we have this uh, quantitative comparison of archaea and shape droplets. That's something that is, uh, again, something that Dick is working on. We might tie in the topo nets stuff. Topo nets happens in a couple of weeks, so once that's finished, I'll have some feedback on that. We can go from there. In 29, we will put um, uh, evolution book, and this is Steve McGrew. We'll put this in the list. Um, and so I guess it's like uh, a published book. I don't know, you know who the publisher would be, but... And then the deadline would be, I guess, TBA. So we'll put that on the list to see, um, you know, keep tra tabs on it. Uh, other than that, I think the, that's pretty much it. We have, uh, there isn't really anything to follow up on right now from this list. So if people have things they want to put on the list, please uh, let me know or put them on yourself if you have... Um, you want to access it directly okay so uh, let's see my knock will work with us me stoyan uh smokov and kevin clark starting in august so that's number 28 so that's oh number 28 is this oh so this quantitative comparison of archaean and shape droplets okay yeah I'll, I'll put a note in there uh I'll just make an, I'll just put this in the notes, section 28. Well, I guess I could put it in here. All right. So, yeah, thanks for that update. Okay, so that's, that's all for the submissions page. Uh, reminder that we have this network neuroscience uh, poster that's due, uh, I think it's due Wednesday. So I've been going through, and I haven't put it in the Slack yet. That's not that's on my that's my fault. Uh, but it's pretty close to being done. It's got a lot of images, like I said. Just they're not like you know specialized images. They're just kind of like communi visually communicating some of the ideas here. So I'll put this in the Slack, and if people want to take a look at it and see um, if you know they want to change anything or add anything, that's you know have any better ideas for images or whatever let me know i'll just put it in the slack channel and then we'll work on it there um and so i think this is pretty much just you know i mean we have this is our space and i think we're covered most of it so i don't know how much more we can add in but definitely it's uh 
So we're going to, I'm going to send it off Wednesday and then they're going to put it up in the session. So um, that's what that looks like. Okay. And so then finally we'll get to our papers here for the week. So we have a couple papers that, uh, some of these are newer, some of these are older. So this is the first one. This is a new paper. It's called Worm Paths. And this is uh, C. elegans Metabolic Pathway Annotation and Visualization. And so I don't know any of these authors. I'm not familiar with them, but uh, this is something from like a systems biology perspective. So this is Metabolic Pathway Visualization. So it's going to be a little bit um, <laughs> intense. I think for a lot of people, but this that's okay. We need to understand metabolic pathways. So um, in our group, we aim to understand meta metabolism in the nematode C. elegans and its relationships with gene expression, physiology, and the response to therapeutic drugs. So as I mentioned before, C. elegans is this, uh, you know, they use this as a model organism for a lot of human uh, uh, health applications a lot of uh, neurological disorders and or you know neurological functions like sleep and other things and so the way that they can make a comparison between worms and humans is that their uh, shared derived genes or their paralogs or homologs of human genes and so they can understand it at the genetic level C. elegans is easy to manipulate at the genetic level and then see something in the phenotype so but of course the, the metabolism is somewhat similar as well, so you can also make that comparison. But our understanding of the metabolism is much less uh, clear than our understanding of C. elegans genetics. So this is a, an important advance for this reason and many other reasons. Uh, visualization of the metabolic pathways that comp uh, comprise the metabolic network. So there's a network of metabolic components that drive and so a drive metabolism. So metabolism is highly what we might call regulated in a network uh, as opposed to something that you just, you know, it's like you flip a switch on and off. You, you know, if it's tied to something like cell division, it's, it's actually quite complex. Uh, so uh, visualization uh, is useful for interpreting a wide variety of experiments. Detailed an annotated metabolic pathway maps for C. elegans are mostly limited to panorganismal maps, uh, which are, I guess, across uh, many organisms, and then you find the things that C. elegans has, and you look at that. So there's nothing that's like specific to C. elegans. It's just largely like things that you might find in any standard organism. And apparently, C. elegans, like most organisms, have specializations in that domain. So you know we want to understand those things. Uh, many of these panorganismal maps come with complete or inaccurate pathway and enzyme annotations. So this is something actually Stephen mentions in his talk is that, you know, when you're working at the cell level in C. elegans, a lot of the cell data that we get, we get a lot, we can segment cells and understand the names and generally the functions. But then, you know, groups will annotate the cells and they'll pass that um, information on to the broader community. The problem is, is that annotations are often quite incomplete. You know, you might say that a uh, cell is, has a certain function, you might give it a sort of a, a, a verbal description, and then that's maybe incomplete, or, you know, verbal descriptions are not uh, very, um, you know, easily uh, sort of circumscribed. Like, you can just use a term and it's very vague in general and there's no real uh, detail in the annotation. So, you know, we want to understand those annotations or at least the functions and, and attaching sort of a, a functional label to a cell more easily. So here they present worm paths, which is composed of two parts. The careful manual annotation of metabolic genes into pathways, categories, and levels. And 62 pathway maps that include metabolites, metabolite structures, genes, reactions, and pathway connections between maps. These maps are available on the Worm Flux website. We show that Worm Paths provides easy to navigate maps and that the different levels of Worm Paths can be used for metabolic pathway enrichment analysis of transcriptomic data. In the future, we envision further developing these maps to be more interactive with an analogy of roadmaps that are available on mobile devices. 
So this is like some, you know, like if you pull up a map on your phone, what that looks like. So that's that's their vision, but they really kind of go into so a lot of these me metabolic maps. Um, they're really kind of you know um, they're, they're pretty complex. If you look at them, they look like this massive subway network, and it's a you know it's kind of a mess to understand what's going on. You can follow the pathways through, but then you know what is going on in in that uh, map. So it's very important to sort of visualize it in a, an effective way and understand what's going on. So um, metabolic reactions function in metabolic pathways that are interconnected to form the metabolic network. In these networks, the nodes are metabolites, which are the little dots, and the edges, which are the lines between them, are conversion and transport reactions carried out by metabolic enzymes and transporters. Uh, so that's the way the, the metabolic networks are stru uh, structured. Genome scale metabolic network models, which are things that are controlling gene expression, um, provide mathematical tools that are invaluable for the systems level analysis of metabolism. So mo such models have been constructed for numerous organisms, including bacteria, yeast, and C. elegans in humans. So they've got these different models for different organisms, but they're improving upon the C. elegans model. And all these bacteria, yeast, and you know, humans obviously is important for human health. Yeast is actually a, a common uh, model for uh, looking at um, animal or metazoan origins of things. So yeast is actually quite an important model organism. And then bacteria is easy to understand. It has a very small genome relative to, you know, I mean, there are only a couple hundred genes in a lot of bacterial genomes. So they have this, uh, you know, simple model that you can understand, and it's usually a single cell. So uh, those are, you know, that's sort of low-hanging fruit for these kind of networks. Uh, metabolic network models are extremely useful because they can be used with using, uh, they can be analyzed using flux balance analysis, which is a specific type of a mathematical analysis they use to show the flow of things through the network. So you, you evaluate each node and you look at the things that are moving between the nodes. And then there's this formal and net mathematical analysis you can do to get a sense of you know, movement in the network. So this allows us to derive specific insights and hypotheses. So uh, then you can also use gene expression profiling data that can also be used to gain insight into metabolic network activity at pathway reaction and metabolite levels under different conditions or in particular tissues. And this is widely applicable with, uh, throughout the organism. Um, so we need to visualize these networks. Um, we also, yeah, they talk about the suitability of C. elegans. Um, and so then this is the Worm Flux website. And so this is their, so they have the network here and they have worm pads. So they're doing things beyond worm pads. They're doing this. Worm flux project, worm path, uh, worm paths. This is their thing. So they have these different pathways that you can choose from, um, and all these different. Let's say collagen biosynthesis. So you can see the pathway here, and this is what the pathway looks like. You have all these different uh, metabolites, and then you can see that it's it's almost like a tree, more than a, a really dense network. But when you can think about this, is just one of maybe. 60 or 70 different things you can plug into this network. So it actually ends up looking very, uh, you know, busy as, a, as an image. So that's one of the things that they're focused on here. Um, and I'm kind of hoping to get, okay, get back to the paper here. And uh, I don't know if they have any images of the networks or the visualizations that they're using. But, uh, so their discussion and vision. Um, so they want to develop this expandable online catalog. Um, so metabolic, meta, uh, metabolic network models such as ICEL 1314 continue to grow and evolve as more experimental data becomes available. Okay, so they want, you know, as you get more, do more experiments, they want to incorporate that into the model. Um, and so the, let's see. I want to see if they have any images. Oh, here we go. 
Okay, so this shows sort of the basic idea of worm flux. Um, this shows like some of these pathways which we just saw. So there, you know, you have a single pathway and it's connected to another pathway. And so you have like, you can model it in terms of different parts of the cell like mitochondria, extracellular space, what's going on in the cytosol. You can partition the, the, the networks in that way. And then any good visualization, you have to have a legend. So this, these are your restrictions or your reactions here, uh, different colors for different types of reactions and, and movement between these nodes. And then, um, yeah, so this is how they're visualizing this. Um, and then they have this figure here where they're comparing sort of worm pads, which is curated meta metabolism genes with worm cat, which is going on at the genome scale. And so they're making this comparison between these two models. So that's a very quick tour into that world. Uh, that's a new tool that's just come online. Um, the next paper is this paper on identification of neural progenitor cells and their progeny reveals long distance migration in the developing octopus brain. So we're going from C. elegans to octopus and we're moving from metabolism up to these, uh, you know, differentiating cells and their progenitor cells, which are not stem cells necessarily, but they're the progenitors to what will become neural cells. So I guess they would be classified as pluripotent cells that are, you know, early forms of a neural cell. Um, so this is an octopus. And so octopus has a fairly large brain and it's a very intelligent animal. And um, there's been a lot of behavioral studies on, you know, how intelligent octopus are. And so uh, people are working on the octopus brain and it's, you know, it's, it's probably far different from a human brain in a lot of ways so it's a cephalopod brain so it's much different but they you know this uh, they're able to still map like between cells and what's going on and then behaviors like long distance migration so in in the brain so they can actually see the cells moving around in the same way and i think we've seen movies of this where um we've seen uh cells in in embryos moving migrating around the brain you can see this same process in the cephalopod brain. So uh, the abstract is cephalopods have evolved nervous systems that par uh, parallel the complexity of mammalian brains in terms of neuronal numbers and richness and behavioral output. So this is richness and behavioral output is what it's doing in the world as opposed to like, you know, cell migration. But that's, it's, it's, it's very much parallel as mammalian brains. So mammalian brains are always used as sort of models for like thinking about uh, artificial intelligence, but cephalopod brains are also probably suitable for that as well. Um, there have been some people who've like explored that, but um, that's that's a story for another time. So how the cephalopod brain develops has only been described at the morphological level, and it remains unclear where the progenitor cells are located and what molecular factors drive neurogenesis. Uh, using histological techniques, we located dividing cells, neural progenitors, and post-mitotic neurons in octopus vulgaris embryos. So they're looking in the embryo, they're looking at these progenitor cells, and they want to see what they're doing in the brain um, as in, during development. Our results indicate that progenitors are located outside the central ring cords in the lateral lips adjacent to the eyes, which is uh, different, a different anatomy, of course, than the mammalian brain suggesting that newly formed neurons migrate into the cords. Lineage tracing experiments ensure that progenitors, depending on their location in the lateral lips, which is a anatomical landmark in the, in the, that, that we don't really have an analog for in mammalian brains, generate neurons for the different lobes. So the brain is uh, divided, the brain is organized into lobes and this is where the neurons are going to be moving around uh, the finding that octopus newborn neurons migrate over long distances is reminiscent of vertebrate neurogenesis and suggests it might be a fundamental strategy for large brain development. So we're making an analogy between cephalopod brains, specifically octopus and mammalian brains. And we're making the statement that there's, there are similar processes going on in these brains 
in terms of development and in developmental migration of cells and differentiation of cells. They're making all sorts of different structures. They have a different developmental trajectory, but you know they, they have the same type of cellular behaviors. So this is, uh, so cephalopods are invertebrates. So they have a very different origin than mammalian brains. Uh, not that different. I mean, they come from the same common ancestor at some point, but the trajectory of their brain development is different uh, and the actual brains look different. So um, let me see if I can find an image. Actually, let me go through this part here where we talk about the, they talk about the adult cephalopod mollusk, Octopus vulgaris. It has a highly centralized brain containing of about 200 million nerve cells in the supra and uh, subceophageal mass in two optic lobes. Yet the cellular and molecular mechanisms driving brain development remain poorly understood. So at hatching, which is when they are born essentially, uh, the oval garrus brain counts about 200,000 cells and occupies roughly one fourth of the total body. So I guess this is a body mass indicating extensive embryonic neurogenesis. In general, neuroprogenitor cells are generated from ectodermal cells and divide symmetrically and asymmetrically to generate all neurons of the nervous system. So this ectodermal cell is like part of the three germ layers that you would see. And then this is the germ layer which all these cells arise. They divide in these different ways and they generate neurons. Uh, and then let's see, includes harboring species with diffuse nerve nets. So in, in um, Cephalopod brains, they use something called a nerve net, which is a little bit different than what we have in the human brain and the human nervous system. Um, they have this uh, sort of, it's like a, a network. It's, it's a, sort of a network of nerves and neurons and uh, of course the central brain, but they have this, you know, where different parts of the body are taking in information. So it's, it's much different than, and a good model for this is the hydra which we haven't talked about, but I've, I've seen people talk about this where the hydra has like this nervous system that is, you know, uh, much different than the way it behaves in terms of like taking in sensory information is much different than the mammalian brain. So, um, so in these, in clades are like taxonomic groups. So these nerve nets, which are diffuse, proliferating neural progenitor cells are distributed throughout the ectoderm, generating local neurons. So in this case, instead of having like in, in a mammalian brain where you have nerves, nerve endings, and then you have a central nervous system and a spinal cord, you have these neurons that emerge throughout the body and they generate local neurons. And then they have this, some phyla have a centralized nervous system, including vertebrates, arthropods, and some anoids, the neuroprogenitor cells are grouped in the neurectoderm. So there's a difference in terms of the developmental trajectory of these nervous systems um, and where these cells emerge in development. So in some of these, uh, in some in some groups of species, you have, uh, you know, their developmental origins are sort of clustered in one location, whereas in these uh, nerve net species, which are the cephalopods, uh, neurons are generated throughout the body in development. Um, so in a distance, long distance migration of neurons has been described for developing, uh, developing vertebrate brains, in which neurons born in different zones follow longer trajectories to their final location where they intermingle to form complex circuits. And so they have, they've uh, described neural, neuronal migration in developing invertebrate systems but they, this has been or limited to restricted cell populations. So not all cell populations. And in one of the examples, they show this, these neuroblasts and C. elegans that exhibit this behavior. But that's not, the typ that's not typical of uh, other types of non-mammalian brains. Uh, you also see short range migratory events in the Drosophila visual system. So this is something that we've seen in vertebrates, this long distance migration. And now we're also seeing it in a cephalopod nervous system as well. Let me see if I can show some pictures of this nervous system. Okay, so this is what it looks like here. Overview of the developing uh, ulvo garris embryo in its nervous system. So here's an example of the nervous system here. Uh, let's see, D is, uh, 
So this is a maximum projection after DAPI staining of a hatchling. So this is a hatchling, and you can see that the um, this shows a densely nucleated central brain. So these bright areas are the central brain here. Um, and so we can see this is the anterior side of the organism. You can also see an image here of the brain in, in terms of its structure. Uh, so yeah, it's this is what it looks like. And you have these, uh, you can see it's different, it's structured quite differently than the mammalian brain. Um, you know, I don't want to get into so much of this, but there's a lot here that's going on that's different, going to be different developmentally. Um, let's see if there are any other images. Okay, so formation of the brain. This is an in situ hybridization of the different tissues in the uh, in this. Uh, they're doing this embryo. They're looking at different sections of the embryo. And so they're showing gene expression, I think, over different um, stages here. So these are different developmental stages where you start to get the formation of a brain. You get this outer layer here, and then you get formation along the edges. And then you start to get these different parts of the brain that come into, they start to get more and more defined over developmental time. And you can see different stages, and you can see the structures being defined. So, yeah, so this is, this is a, a long, again, this is another very involved paper, and you'd have to really examine it to get a good sense of what's going on. I thought I would present it. I just wanted to show a little bit about some other system that, you know, that we can make uh, analogies to, because we usually talk about C. elegans, and a lot of people are familiar with mammalian brains, at least superficially. And I wanted to give people a little bit more of a taste of some of the other nervous systems that exist in nature. So this is actually trajectory mapping where they're looking at migrating cells. So this is uh, where they show they inject this tracer into the brain, into these different cells, and they're able to watch how they migrate. So you can see that there's this migration pattern for the cell, and they migrate uh, a fairly long distance. And so this is the uh, population of label, labeled cells on the lateral lips as visible G through L. So this is where they, they talk about the lateral lips. Uh, and this is kind of where that is in the brain. And you can see migration of cells within that structure. So, and then, uh, yeah, this, this shows like, uh, the gene expression of different things going on in different species in the cephalopod uh, clade, as they say. So this is uh, this is the elk group uh, vertebra, so cephalopoda, annelids, arthropods, cnidaria. So this is actually a bigger clade. This is a, a, a clade that includes cnidaria and vertebrates. So they actually show the differential gene expression here. These are genes that are developmental genes that you would see yeah, very generally speaking, control neurogenesis. So these things are expressed in these different uh, categories. And you can see there's variation across different brains. So this is these are vertebrate brains, for example, and cephalopod brains. And they actually have uh, somewhat similar gene expression patterns, uh, especially compared to cnidarians and arthropods. But, you know, they just show that, that variation. They're not saying anything more about it. Um, this shows you kind of the control of progenitor types and how they control differentiation from the progenitor cell. So that's uh, that paper. And if you're interested, I can give you a link to this folder. Let me put it in the chat. So let's see, we have some comments here. Um, let me go back up here. Let me unshare my screen. We'll go through the comments. Uh, this is the, I put this link to the, uh, Submissions doc. Okay, so Susan says octopi are smart. Yes, they're smart sociopaths. Yeah, they've they've taken pictures of octopi like in a, an aquarium at night. They've had like cameras on the tank, and they've seen them get out of their tanks and walk around the aquarium and do things like eat other fish and things like that. So yeah, it's uh, <laughs> you would expect with with big brains like that that they would be you know 
doing stuff like that. So, um, and they're good at opening lids. Yeah, they they can open lids with their um, with their appendages. Uh, octopus paper URL. So that's uh, I'll get that for you. I don't have the actual URL of the paper. I have to get the URLs are tricky because I, like you can get a you can go to the stub of the journal or you can go to some other place where it is and um, good thing they have short lives. Yeah, they're not very long lived, which is, you know, kind of, you know, you might think, well, why do we have big brains? And you might say, well, we're long lived. We're actually not as long lived as, say, like, you know, uh, whales, for example, but, you know, they have big brains too, but, you know, that's, that's maybe not the best explanatory framework because, you know, octopi have pretty big brains and they don't live that long. So, so there are a lot of things, um, I, again, I just wanted to present it to show a lot of the diversity of brains in, in especially in development. So, uh, well, all right. So I think that's it for this week. Uh, did we have anything else we wanted to talk about before we go? Yeah, I saw a YouTube video of opening lids, and they had no practice whatsoever. They just handed them a, a jar with a screw on it, and yeah. they went right to it and opened it within a minute. Like, it was just done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't hide your shrimp not, not, in, a, not in a jar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can't hide from the octopus. Um Dick said thanks. So yeah, thanks for attending. And next week, if you have anything to present, you know, uh, we have time during the meeting. Uh, my knock again. We look forward to your next report on your uh, project. And um, if you need anything during the week, let me know on Slack. Have a great week. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Yeah.